Welcome Grade 11s. Today we're going to be starting off with data representation. This is the first of a two-part series and it's going to be the introduction. My name is Hayley and I'm going to be taking you through today's lesson. Today we're going to be dealing with the introduction to data representation. We're going to discuss how we organize the data and finally displaying of the data. So let's begin. Right. What is data? Now, data is everything around you that has a number. Anything that you would need to analyze, to question. I want to open up a shopping center and I need to find out what kind of shops to have. I would collect data. Um, the census that they're going to be doing in this country, that is collecting data on a very big scale. Now you get small scale and big scale data collections. But the important thing is now analyzing that data. So let's just see what it says here. Data handling refers to the process of collecting, so that's our collection, organizing, and displaying, and then analyzing the data. Data refers to the numerical information gathered via various methods. Once the data has been analyzed, conclusions need to be drawn, and the initial question needs to be answered. So if I was opening up a shopping center, my question would be, what kind of shop would I be putting into the shopping center? If we're doing a whole country census, well, the question is, how many people are there? Where do they live? How many people per house, et cetera, et cetera. So it all depends on what the information you want is to what kind of questions you will ask and what kind of data you will collect. Once we've got our data, once we've got our data, we need to organize the data. It's very important to be able to organize the data in a way that allows for easy analysis. That is our key here. We want it to make it easy to analyze and easy for us to answer the question that we originally asked. A good way of doing this is with a frequency table. And you can see how many of each data points there are and it helps you count or tally the data and then answer the questions relating to the number of data points. Um, you can also work out your highest point, your lowest, what is your most popular frequency and kind of questions like that. Let's just go into, I'm going to go to the bottom of this page and get some more paper. Um, let's just analyze a tally table. So let's look at an example of say I had 30 people that I was looking at and I wanted to know how many rooms they had in their house. So we're going to be looking at rooms in a house. I'm randomly selecting 30 people, first 30 people I see and I'm going to ask them how many rooms do you have in your house. And let's look, I've got just some random numbers, I'm going to give you some answers. So we'll say, okay, let's say there was three, the first person said three and three and five, two, two, three. Right, and then we had six, two, 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 three and two. If those were just the first kind of 10 people. Now, if I want to arrange this right now, I've just got numbers on a page. They are absolutely meaningless and I cannot make any analysis from this. So what we would do is we would analyze it into a frequency table, or place it into a frequency table. So let's just look at our numbers. And in my frequency table, I'm going to have the number of rooms. And then I'm going to have a tally. And I just want to show you how we create a tally. And after that, we will have the frequency. Right, let's change the color pen. So, I'm going to start from the beginning. Now, I know that you all have this instinct to now start and look for 
all the number ones and then all the number twos and then all the number threes and it takes time and my problem with you doing this is that you tend to leave out a number and it's very hard to go back and check. So what I really want you to get into the habit of doing and what I want you to do is to go in order of the data. So we've got our number of rooms of one, two, three. I'm going to have to move this down a little bit. Four, five, and six. My rooms went up to six. Okay, let's extend my graph. And now I'm going to go back to those information. Right. The first three is what I want to look at, and that I'm going to put into my tally table. Let's just make lines here so it makes it easier for us to see. Right, so the first three, I'm going to put it into my tally table as a line. The second three is a line. Then I've got a five. Okay, then moving up, I've got a two. Let me go back to the data. I've got a two and another two, and a three, and then a six. And this is how I want you to complete the tally table. So you go in order of the information because it's absolutely essential that you get every single number. And we're going to do a few checks and I'll show you as we go where the checks are. So um, I'm going to carry on with this, um, with this table, but I've already done the analysis. I'm gonna show you um, how many, right, so twos, we actually had um, five, there were 11 twos. So I'm basically doing something now that I told you not to do. Okay, there was only one one, I left that one out. Um, threes, there were four, five. Don't forget, that's how you write the five. It's four lines down and then your line across. There were six, um, four, there were also six. Five, there were four and six, there were two. So I really want you to go through the data one by one to get the tally table. Once you've got the tally table, we will now write in our frequency. So we had one with, we had 11 twos, we had three, we had five plus one was six, fours, we had five plus one, that was six, five, we had four, and six, we had two. Now the reason we write our tallies like that is it's easier to add up. And now I'm going to check that I've actually got all my numbers. So I'm going to add these up. So we've got 12, 18, 24, 28, 30. And I started off with 30 numbers, so I know I've got all the numbers there. So that is just an example of a random frequency table. All right, let's go back to the notes. So it's now easy to interpret. Wait, let's go back to that frequency table. I can now see the majority of people that I saw of those 30 had two rooms in their house. The least number of rooms was one. And three and four were the same, five was a little bit less, and very few people had two. I can work out percentages, I can analyze this, I can put it into a graph, and it's easier for me to interpret rather than all of these numbers and especially this was only 30 values imagine now if i've got thousands of values or if we're doing the census now we've got millions of values we need to be able to put them into something we can easily understand okay so once we've got that we're now going to display the data there are many different ways of organizing data it can be displayed graphically which is always a good way of displaying things because we say a picture says a thousand words. Graphically, I can quite easily see what I'm looking for. Um, and then it also depends on the type of data that you have and what kind of graph you will draw. Right, so we've got discrete data. Now, what does discrete data mean? Discrete data is data that you can count. There's no half numbers. It's just a whole number and it's something you can count. So for example, the number of taxis on the road. I can't talk about half a taxi because there is no such thing as half a taxi. So it's either one taxi or two taxis. There's nothing in between. Um, and for those, you would use either a single bar graph, a compound bar graph, or a pie chart. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of each one of those. Um, so let's, let, let's look at it here. Right, a single bar graph would be just 
bars. Now remember the word bar is the one you can see through. So if we're sitting in our homes behind burglar bars, we can see through the bars. Bar graph has spaces in between the columns. A compound bar graph is one where you would have more than one, um, let's change the color, more than one piece of information, more than one graph on the page. But again, you would then have, let me put another one there, Get back to my green. So I would be looking at two pieces of information, but related to the same concept. Um, we're going to do one later on. I know there's in that question. So that would be a bar graph. Still has spaces in between. And lastly, a pie chart. Well, a pie chart is just pieces of a whole. And that's what a pie chart looks like. For continuous data, that's data that can be measured. That's data where you're talking about something in between. Um, so for example, your age. You're not one and then two, you're one and a half and one in a few days and, and two and et cetera, et cetera. Or your mass. We can talk about less than a kilogram. So you might be 54.3 kilograms. And, um, or your heart centimeters, there isn't value in between. That is continuous data. For continuous data, we don't do a, um, bar, a, a bar graph, but rather a histogram. So now your histogram is your graph where your lines are continuous. There is no, nothing in between. So we go from one to the next. We go from 110 centimeters to 111, it continues. Right, so now let's look at a line graph and a bro broken line graph. First of all, what is the difference between the two? Well, a line graph is where we've got a solid line, and a broken line graph is where it actually looks broken. Um, and although I've told you that a broken line graph is used for continuous data, it is also used for discrete data. Um, so we'll discuss line graphs as uh, together. I'm going to delete those for a second so we can look at an example. So if I was looking at a line graph of say the temperature in um, the province that you're sitting in over a period of say a week um, and I'm going to just randomly say well okay it starts there and it goes up on Tuesday, it's a Monday, Tuesday, it goes down a little bit on Wednesday, and up, etc., etc. So you can see that this continues from one day to the next, and your temperature, you're kind of going to have a line graph. So, um, so those are your graphs that you can use to interpret. Now, your graphs make it a whole lot easier for you to analyze the data. That's exactly why we place things into graphs. The nice thing is, is that they're probably going to tell you what type of graph you need to do in an exam. They're not going to leave it very open for you. They're going to say, draw a pie chart, draw a bar graph. Sorry, they're not going to say, draw a pie chart. They're going to say, interpret a pie chart. Um, you will not be asked to draw a pie chart, but they will ask you to draw a line graph or a histogram or a bar graph. So as long as you know the difference between all of them, then you set. So, Let's go through and see what our questions look like. So, starting off with question one. Tando conducts a survey amongst learners at King's High School. She's using a survey questionnaire. Now, survey is a good way of getting data. So, let's see what kind of information she was looking for and what kind of survey she used. By completing the survey slip below, show how patients would complete the survey form. Right, before we go and ask what patients, how patients completed the survey, let's look at the survey and see what kind of questions Tando was looking at. So let's look at our survey. We're looking at an influenza survey in 2009. It's nice to have a heading to a survey just so that everybody knows what they're answering and why they're answering. In a survey, you want quick questions that are easy to analyze and that answer your question. So. You're not going to ask people for their name. You're not going to ask people for their opinion because it's very hard to analyze. So in our survey, she's decided whether it's male or female, and then the age category. Now, she didn't just say age and leave a space. So we could have just said age and leave a space, but it kind of makes it harder to analyze. She has grouped the ages, 13 to 14, 
15 to 16, and 17 to 19. Her survey is aimed at those kind of people. So the first question she's going to ask when she actually sees somebody to take the survey is, do you fit into those categories? If they don't fit into those categories, then it's pointless asking the survey. Um, did you get influenza during the winter term? And that was from April to September 2009. And yes or no. Was this confined to H1N1 or the swine flu or seasonal flu? So, and then the answer were H1N1 or seasonal flu. How sick were you? Okay, mildly ill, very ill or hospitalized? And how many days were you absent from school? One to two, three to four, five to seven or more than seven? So clearly she's looking at the flu, she wants to know about H1N1 and she's dealing with something within her school. Maybe not necessarily her school, but within school going age. And with our ages, we're looking at high school learners. Right, let's now see, let's delete all that and let's answer the questions. So, moving up. Right, what was the question? The question now says, how would patients complete the survey form? She is a 16-year-old girl who was very ill, absent, oops, absent for more than a week and hospitalized for H1N1 or the swine flu symptoms. Now there's a lot of information there. I need to take it one step at a time. So first of all, let's start at the beginning. So patients is a 16 year old girl. So how are we going to complete this? We're going to say, well, she's female and she is in that category. And we normally put a cross by each one. She was very ill. So did she get influenza during the winter season? Clearly she did, she was very ill. Was this confirmed as H1N1 or seasonal flu? Well, let's go back and read this. It, she was hospitalized for H1N1, so clearly it was H1N1. How sick were you? Well, go back to the information and we see that she was hospitalized. So we're going to complete hospitalized. And how many days were you absent from school? She was absent for more than a week. So how many days in a week? There are seven days in a week. So she was absent for more than seven days. Now I want you to reread the question and just check, have we actually answered everything that they've asked? So um, we're gonna just double check that. So she was 16 year old girl, we've done that, so that's tick and tick. She was very ill, she was hospitalized, she was absent for more than a week, and she had the H1N1 swine flu symptoms. So we have completed, and we have completed the survey. So let's see what Tundra does with all these surveys. So we go back, she conducted the survey. Now, Tundra summarized her data from all the completed questionnaires in the table below. We want to use the summary to answer the questions which follow. Before we go on to the questions and before we decide, uh, we, before we even look at the questions, I want us to analyze the summary that Tando made. So I'm going to go through everything and she has put it onto this beautiful spreadsheet. So the results of her survey, she split the males and females and we knew we had age groups. So for males, we've got 13 to 14, etc., etc. Females also by age group. Then the number that had no flu, no flu at all. Um, H1N1 flu that were absent for one to two days, three to four, five to seven, and seven. And finally, seasonal flu and the days that they were absent. And at the bottom here, she's given us the totals. So this is the total males that were 13 to 14, et cetera, et cetera. So all the information from her survey is now in this beautiful one little page um, summary. And quite easily, I can read off any information and I don't struggle to pick up the information. But even easier than this would actually be a graph. So the question that we asked is, uh, no, Tanda summarized her data from all the completed questionnaires. No, we've done that. Question as far as right. First question, how many males 
and females of all ages participated in the survey. So we're looking for our total males. So I'm going to take our totals and add them up. So let's extend our page a little bit and I'm going to use a calculator. So we now have 23 males plus um, let me find my list. 29 plus 20 and we get a total of 72 males. Let's write that into our into our so we had 72, I need a pen, 72 males. And how many females? Was the question asked for males and females. So I'm going to add up my females. That's 34 and 33 and 31. So let's add up those. So 34 plus 33 plus 31. And we get a total of 98 females. So go back to our class. So we've got 98 females. Fairly easy question. And you're going to get these easy questions when it comes to tables and graphs and data handling, where you're basically just answering um, based on the table and giving a little bit more information. She might have wanted to put a total table. It might have been important to her, but, um, well, um, she didn't. So. I want to go back just to read the question again and check that I have actually answered the question correctly. So it says, how many males and females of all ages participated in the survey? I have answered that question correctly. So let's move on to the next part of the question. Um, she summarized the data. We still got to start. Right, the second part. What percentage of boys of all ages who got influenza suffered from seasonal influenza? So let's find some more space. As soon as I see the word percentage. As soon as I see percentage, what do I know? I know I am going to times by 100. So that's the first thing I'm going to do every time. When I read the question, it says percentage of boys of all ages. So that is what I am going to divide by of boys and how many boys did we have we had 70 not there we had 72 boys so i'm looking at the total out of the 72 boys in total and now what am i actually looking for influenza suffered from seasonal influenza so i've got my seasonal influenza that's my seasonal flu okay i'm looking at boys of all ages so I'm basically looking at um, all of these boys. So now I'm going to have to add those up quickly. So 6 plus 4 is 10, 12, 13. I'm going to just write the numbers here. Plus 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Plus 6, 7, 8, 10. Whoops, that's not doesn't look like a 10. So plus 10. So let's add those up. So I've got 30 four boys that are in this section over here. And that's the percentage we're looking for. So we're going to say 34 divided by 72 and times 100. Now I've already got my times 100, what I'm dividing by, so it makes it easier once I've got my total. Let's do that on our calculator. And on our calculator we can do it as two ways. We can actually use our fraction button, which is really useful. So let's use the fraction button in this case. So we've got 34 divided by 72 and times by 100 and we get an answer of 47.22 percent. Now the question never told me how many decimal places to round off to. So I'm going to assume that every time I do anything I round to two decimal places unless I've been instructed otherwise. As you know, your instructions at the beginning of every exam, it's going to tell you round to two decimal places. So that's what I'm going to do in this case. So I'm going to put in that answer of 47.22 and percent. Don't forget your units. In this case, it's 47.22 percent. So it's important that I actually have my units as well as the answer. My two decimal places and then I've got my answer totally correct. Quick check, did I actually answer the question? So it said, what percentage of boys of all ages who got influenza suffered from seasonal influenza? 
think I've answered the question correctly. And again, I'm checking again. Does it tell me must I round off to a whole number or anything like that? It doesn't say. So in that case, two decimal places. All right, let's see what else Tanda did. So the third part of the question, Tanda wrote her report. Two thirds of teenagers affected by H1N1 were absent for a period of more than four days. Show how she came to this conclusion. Whenever they say show, we're going to have to use either percentage or numbers from the table. So first let's look at what we're looking at on the table and then we will come back to her statement of two thirds. So we're looking for teenagers affected by H1N1. So we're looking in that section over here. Whoops. Um, we're absent for a period of more than four days. So no, we're not looking for the whole thing any longer. We're looking for only the ones more than four days. So it's those ones over there. Um, and let's now add up all our totals. So I'm going to take away this line because it actually will be easier for us to see the numbers. So we need to see how many teenagers were in this section. So I'm going to add up all the teenagers. So I'm going to extend my page here, but move up a little bit so I can see. Absent for five, right, so we've got three plus five plus six plus 11. Clearly the girls were much sicker, plus 10 plus 10. Now, you can use your calculator to answer this kind of question. And in fact, I recommend that you do use your calculator. We can do it in our heads, but you know what? We tend to make mistakes. And if you'd like to take your calculator and actually sit with a calculator and say, well, OK, let me just move this up a little bit so I can see those numbers again. Take the calculator and say, well, it was 1 plus 2 plus 4. We can do that. Um, use your calculator. You've been given a calculator. Use it. So. Once I've added up the columns though, so let me do it, um, I'm going to say 3 plus 5 plus 6 plus 11 plus 10 plus 10. Right, and I get an answer of 45. So let's go back here, and our answer is 45. What does that 45 represent? That's 45 teenagers were absent for more than four days and were affected by the H1N1. So, 45 teenagers. Have I answered my question? No, I've only just kind of started the process. So, I need to look at, she said two thirds of teenagers affected. So, I need to now look at my total number of teenagers affected. So, I've got my 45, and what, um, what am I looking at is teenagers who were affected by H1N1. I now need to know the total teenagers who were affected. Total affected. Um, that's not an E. I need to look for the total affected. So that's what two thirds of teenagers aff affected with are the total. So now I'm looking for my total teenagers, which is that entire list, including my 45. Now I've got my 45, so what I can do is just now add the balance. So I'm going to say 45, and I'm going to, let's do this with the calculator this way. So I had my 45, now I'm going to add 2 plus 1, um, in fact I'm going to add it as 3, and then I'm going to add here, we've got 4, and um, I'm going to just remember remember what that was, so it was 4, and then I've got another 4, 4, 3, and 4. So let's go back to the calculator and add those. It was um, 4 plus another 4 plus 3 and plus 4. So I've got a total of 67 learners were affected by the H1N1 virus. So let's write that into our information. So we had 67, that's not a 6, 67 learners were affected. So going back to her statement, Tanda wrote in her report that two-thirds of teenagers affected by H1N1 virus were absent for a period of more than four days. 
Now I've got all the information that I need to analyze whether her statement was correct or incorrect and to basically show how she came to this conclusion. So I have the number of learners that were affected was 45. The number of affected that had were absent for more than four days. Out of the total that were affected is 67. And I'm going to look at that as maybe a percentage because what is two thirds? Two thirds, okay, or let's look at it as a ratio. So I'm going to, on my calculator, I'm going to look at a percent, at, at a fraction, 45 over 67, and I get an answer of 0 0.67. So let's put that into my information here. That is 0 0.67. That number rings a bell in my head, and I'm hoping that it rings a bell in your head, because I know if I'm looking at a third of something, and how well this pie chart's going to draw, if I'm looking at one third, and one third, and one third, each one of those represents 33%, or um, 0 0.34. So two thirds actually represents 0, 67 or let's make it 67 percent kind of rounded off to one whole number what answer have i got here i have actually got that 0 0.67 is the same as my two-thirds so clearly from all my calculations that i've done i have shown how she came to this conclusion and i have tested it and shown that she was correct so she wrote on a report that two-thirds of teenagers affected by H1N1 virus were absent for a period of more than four days. We've done all those calculations and we have shown how she came to that conclusion. When you're answering a question like this, where it's kind of like very broad and it doesn't give you very specific guidelines, I want you to just try and be very logical and move from one step to the next and explain to the examiner what you're doing every step of the way. So if we go through my calculations, you can see that I kind of put notes every time I did a calculation. So it showed me, and it showed somebody else who was actually going to be reading this, my examiner, what I am doing. And that's very important. It's very important for you to explain what you're doing. So I had my 45 teenagers that, um, that had H1N1 my total I've worked out a ratio of the total and then I even did this little drawing to show that two-thirds is equal to what I have left out from this information is showing that kind of like therefore um, the 60 the 45 over 67 is equal to two-thirds of the population so make sure and go back and reread your question reread your answer I'm, uh, I'm sorry and see have you actually told somebody else who didn't know what you were exactly thinking but have you told them what you were thinking so they can give you all the mark allocations right so let's see what else Tando did right, going back to our survey were girls and boys equally affected by the influenza h1n1 using information from the table explain your answer whenever they give you a table and ask you to compare one category to another, in this case males to females, what I want you to do is I want you to think about percentage. Percentage is the way, an easy way to compare data. Now if you remember a couple of moments ago, I said to you it seems like the females are more sick than the males, but let's look at our data. So, it can't just compare the numbers. We have to compare it as a percentage of the total. We had less males answering the survey than we had females. So it's not just a one for one kind of ratio. So let's use the information in the table and explain our answer. So first of all, I want to see how many boys were affected. So. Um, by the H1N1, so let's find some more space, and I'm going to look at only the boys that were affected, and that's that information over there. So we've got um, 
add that up to that's six plus um, four eight nine plus two four and you can do this on your calculators right and that is ten so how many have I got in total I've got 25 don't be scared to use your calculator so we could have added that totally up on the calculator 25 affected boys does that mean anything to me not really because I need to work it out as a percentage so we had calculated earlier and you can go back and check but there were 72 boys so I'm going to look at it as a percentage times by 100 percentage of boys that were affected so 25 divided by 72 and times by 100 so on my calculator I'm going to use my fraction 25 divided by 72 times 100 and I get an answer of 34.72 percent so let's write that into here we've got 34.72 percent what is that 34.72 explain to the examiner that is your males right now let's look at our females so our females are those values there so we've got um, 14 15 I'm gonna have to gonna have to write this down okay so we've got 15 plus let's go back and calculate that right uh, three that's 13 and our last column is 4 9 14 so clearly there are more girls that were sick so okay let's use our calculator to add that up uh, 15 plus 13 plus 14 right that doesn't work <laughs> let's clear that again try that again 15 plus 13 plus 14 I'm actually glad that I made such a silly little mistake because I know that you all tend to believe what your calculator says so we get an answer calculator says so therefore it must be true I need you sometimes to go back and check did I actually do the right thing on the calculator you saw a second ago I left out a plus and I got an answer that did not make sense to me so I always try and make sense of the answer so I've got 42 females that's 42 females out of a total we had 98 females to start and I'm going to work that out as a percentage for me to compare 25 males to 42 females is not a good idea because I had less males than females. I'm expecting this answer. Let's use a different color so I can show you what I'm talking about. I'm expecting this number to be less than that number, but I don't know the significance of the comparison. And the only way I can do that is work it out as a percentage. So I'm going to calculate my females as a percentage. So I've got my 42 out of my 98 females 98 um, and times that by 100 and we get an answer of 42.85 percent so now let can write that in here so we've got 42.8 percent females now that I'm dealing with percentage I can now quite easily compare these two values so I had 34 percent equal sign there 34 percent um, males and 42 percent females and now quite easily I can say therefore my females were more affected my females were more affected what did the question actually ask the question says were girls and boys equally affected by influenza using the information in the table explain your answer have I answered the question correctly well I've said that females are more affected so I suppose in a way I have but I'd like to be very specific so I want to go back to my answer and say no and I'm going to fill that in there so no boys and girls were not equally affected females were more affected they had a higher percentage so always make sure that you have answered exactly what they ask you and rather give them more information than less so.
Right. And if you go back to my question and the way I've answered it, you can see that it was quite a logical step and anybody looking at this information would be able to understand the steps that I took to get my answer. Right, let's see what else Tanda did. Tanda illustrated her participants in the following graph. So she drew a graph. And remember I said to you, a graph, it says a thousand words. Look how simple her graph is. And that is all the information that was on that table that was not too complicated. Right. Um, complete the graph by giving labels for the numbers A to E. So we need to now just complete our graph. So I'm going to look at the graph and see what we're looking at. Right. I have, she has split the, the graph into, what kind of graph is this, first of all? This is a bar graph but a multiple bar graph. We are looking at three pieces of information and we're comparing one set to another set. So we have a space, always have a space in the beginning, we have a space between all the bars. But the three that we're looking at together, there is no space. Right, so this heading a is your heading, and a heading is very important. So we need to be able to look at this graph in 20 years' time and say, well, okay, she was looking at the influenza comparison between males and females of all ages, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go back and see what her table actually said, so we can get a good view from that. Results of the survey of the questionnaire, and we're just going to look at what her questionnaire is. Uh, learners of King High School using a survey. Um, so that's information, let's fill in. So this could be Tando survey of, so kind of like something like Tando survey. Of high school learners. And be very specific, high school learners of different ages. Learn, that's not how you spell learners. of different ages and their results of whether they had influenza or um, seasonal flu. So we can carry on and writing in all that information. What is this over here? Now, we're looking at the numbers from 0 to 40. I've got, for example, 13 to 14 is just under 30. Four. So I'm going to go back to my table and see where I can find that. So my table, 13 to 14, just under 34. Well, 13 to 14, here I've got 23, there I've got 34. So I'm looking at the number of learners. So my graph here clearly has number of learners. And so this will be um, number of learners. And this is a good thing to remember, that whenever you're drawing a graph in your, in your uh, bar graph, you normally have your frequency on the y-axis. That's your vertical axis. Now, I quite clearly saw that those were females. Right, so I'm going to go and check the rest to see how I label D and E. But, OK, let's do that first. So D, I saw that that was females. This is also between 30 and 30. Uh, 30 and 35, and it's 15 to 16. So let's go back to the table and see where I found that number. 15 to 16, well, there's my 33, and the last one is 31. So let me see if I see that. The last one is 31. So this is clearly my females. And I'm going to take a guess that this one is my males. But I'm also going to go and check. I never just assume that this is what happens. So 13 to 14 is between 20 and 25. And then I've got between 25 and 30, and then on about 20. So let's go back to my table and see what those numbers are. Between 25 and 30, that's that one. Between 25 and 30, and then lastly was 20. So clearly I was correct in saying that those are my males. And then what do you see? C tells me, what are we looking at? And I've got females and males. So in total, these two categories make up the gender. And now we have completed 
all the labels. Let's go just back. She's illustrated. She's complete the graph by giving the labels for A to E. We've done that and we've answered the question. Okay, question two. Let's first read through the question and see what kind of questions they're going to ask us. So, below are charts and tables of data from Statistics South Africa. Statistics South Africa is a wonderful site where you get a whole lot of information and very often when you've got data that you're analyzing in a test situation it actually comes from stats essay um, these give the number of unemployed people in 1998 i'm sure that's important and the total population in south africa for the years 91 to 99. in these tables people classified according to previously racial classifications before we carry on with the question, I'm going to look at each one of the tables or graphs and analyze each one of those very carefully. So our first graph that we have is the number of people unemployed in South Africa in October household survey in 1998. So clearly they were doing a survey of households in the country in 1998 in October. What kind of questions were they asking? Were you employed or not? So that is what the graph is telling us. Your heading always gives you the most information. Starting off, I'm looking at my axes first to understand what the data is. So remember I said to you, your y-axis is normally your frequency. So I'm going from zero to 6,000. But if I read the information, it says the number of unemployed people in thousands. And very often they do this on a graph because it is really hard to write these very, very big numbers. So we basically take all our numbers and divide them by 1,000 and then say, well, this is in 1,000. So this 1,000 frequency that I'm actually looking at is not 1,000, but rather it is 1,000, 1,000. That's 1,000, 1,000. So how many people am I looking at? I'm actually looking at a million people in that category there. Okay, so look out for that kind of information when you've got a table, a, a graph. We now have three different categories and we're looking at a multiple bar graph. So my first um, part of the graph is telling me total. So total of what? And I've got three different ones. These, these are my male. These are, sorry, these are both. These are male and these are female. So my total, my uh, male and my female for the total number of people unemployed in South Africa in this time period. And what is important to note is very often they give you the values underneath the graph or they might write the value on top so they might say that this is five, six, three, four. If they do that, it makes it a little bit more accurate and a little bit easier for us to understand. So what does this number mean? It actually means that there were 5,634,000 ,000 people that were unemployed. So if I had to add my three zeros, I can see that it was 5.6 million people that were unemployed in October 98. And then it's specified into your males and females. And then the graph then carries on by giving us more details of what this total comprises. So we've got, and remember, it was our previously um, racial classifications. So I've got my African and black, and again, it gives me my total, my males, and my females. Colored, total, males, females, um, Asian and Indian, and white. Now, what's nice about the table they've given us these values is because over here, it is hard for us to read those numbers off the graph, which normally we would just uh, kind of use, a, use your ruler to draw a line across and see how many people that represents. But it's very hard for me to tell the difference between these males and females, and even, in fact, the total. So um, it's nice that they've given us the values. And now that I've put a line through it, you can't see them. So I can quite clearly see that that 83 made up 44,000 males and 39,000 females. And the same thing with all the others. So it makes it easier for us to interpret the table. Um, I can see that my totals are adding up my males and females, which makes sense. We only have males and females. Right, let's look at the next. Now we've got a table. So 
This is the populations of South Africa. The total population, that's people classified as African black or colored, and the number of people again in thousands. So the numbers are big numbers, but they're not in the millions, which makes it a little bit easier for us to see. So let's go through each one of the categories and see what exactly we're looking at. So we're looking at mid-year, mid-year, probably June, July. And the years, we've got our years going down here, so 91. So I'm going to look at 98 because my graph, my table above was 1998. And somewhere in the question, I remember them saying something about 1998. So I'm going to just analyze that particular row and see what am I looking at. Well, I've got my total population. Now, this has got nothing to do with employment. This is total population. So mid-year 1998, there were 40 2,130,000 people. So I'm going to write this number in somewhere um, so we can see what this number actually looks like. Let's extend the page for a second. It was 42,130. It was 42,130, and I need my thousands. And it was probably a little bit more than that. I'm sure that they've rounded it off somewhere along, this, along the way. So we had 42 million people in South Africa total um, mid-year 1998. So that's what that total. Then it actually breaks it down into males and females. And my guess is if you had to add those two up, you would see that it gives you the total. So that was our total population. And then they've taken this total and broken it down further into these previously um, categorized um, um, classifications, racial racial classifications. So my African or black, I had 32, 449, males, females, then colored, I had kind of 3.7 million. I'm talking about 3.7 million. I want to actually just take that number for a second and I said 3.7 million. And I just want to come out with where did I get that number. So it was 37, let's go to the exact number, it was 37210, 37210, no, which one was I looking at? Um, what was that, 3721. That was the number I was looking at, and I know that's thousands, so I'm going to add my three zeros. So can you see that 3.7 million is equal to 3,721,000. This is roughly kind of like um, rounded off. So whenever you see that number, because often they do give you numbers where they say 3.7 million and ask you to put it into numbers. So we would do this, and you can do it on your calculator. You can say a 3.7, and then I'm going to times it by a million so that I don't make a mistake. And you tend to sometimes make a mistake if we're increasing and moving our decimal place. So just take your calculator and say um, 3.7 times by a million. One, two, three zeros, one, two, three zeros. And we see that it is 30, um, 3,700,000 if you count all your zeros. What I did was I did the reverse. I had this number of, um, let's look back at my number, I had this number and I kind of divided it by a million to see how many millions there were. Okay, so that's just on the side, once we were talking about that. So let's go back to analyzing. So we had the, the number of um, colored people made up of your males and females. And then our table tended to carry on. Um, this was our continued table. No, that's not it. Maybe I need a pen to highlight that. Okay. Um, this was a continuation of the table. So now it's a classification of the Indian, Asian, and white, or unspecified or others. Whenever you do a survey, you tend to find that you have this information of unspecified or other. Those are the people that didn't know how to classify themselves, that could be one reason. Didn't want to classify themselves, that could be another reason. But we can't disregard those people because they make up our total population. So very often we do have an unspecified or other, which um, often doesn't make sense. Why would you need to have it? But it does occur. And especially when you're dealing with big numbers like 42 million people. So 
we can't disregard them because we would be leaving out 385,000 people. So we need to include them as well. Right, let's see what our next graph is. So uh, various racial classifications. Right, now we've got a racial classification, which we've been dealing with all along, and the percentage of unemployed people in 1998. So, and again, it's been specified. So each one of our tables and our graphs has kind of done the same thing. It has been looking at our total population, males and females, then African black total um, males, females, colored males, females. So there's been some standard consistency throughout the tables, which is very important. So we know we're looking at the same type of information. Now, um, and it gives us our percentage of unemployed in 1998. So they have actually used, let's go back for a second, they have used this table, this, this, no, this is not a table, they've used this graph that we have over here of the people unemployed in 98, and they have compared it to our totals that we have in 98, and they've put them into percentages. And remember I said to you, percentages are easy to compare. So that is why we've got them in percentages. When I look at this table, and I see that my total population was 13.37, that is percent unemployed in 1998, and I see that my males was 12.46%, and my females 14.22% kind of a bell's going off in my head. Why does that not make sense? Um, so let's go back to that last table and we saw that each one of these added up, my males and females added up to my total. So why now when I'm looking at percentage, have I not got that my males and females added up, give me my percentage? In fact, in this case, I've got my total females is higher than my total population. And something there's bells are going off and thinking, this does not make sense. So I'm going to go back to analyze this table and see where I've kind of made a mistake in my thinking, thinking that they should add up. So we're looking at the percentage unemployment of the total population. So that will be the number of people unemployed out of the total population. And then we're looking at the number of people unemployed out of the total male population. And the number of, so that will give us 12.446%, and the number of females unemployed out of the total female population. So that's where these percentages come from. So we cannot add those two to give us a total population because this was only looking at females and this and the first one was only looking at males. So I could probably go back to the data and do the calculations to get those answers. But once I've made sense of the answers, or once I've made sense of the data, I don't think that it's necessary. So at this stage, I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to carry on analyzing this table and see that my total black right, was 15.56. Um, and again, this is looking at a number that I would have expected it to fall into my 13.37, but it doesn't because I'm looking at the total unemployed out of the total African and black population. So I'm not looking at the total South African population. If I was looking at the total South African population, then all my percentages would add up to my totals. So, and then we've got our male black and our female black, and again, females was higher than the total. Um, colored, male and female, in total, again, our females was higher. Here we've got first time that we actually see the Indian and Asian uh, community. The males were higher than the total and higher than the female, and in our white, we also had more males than females. Right, now let's go, once we've analyzed all these um, graphs and all these tables, and let's go see what kind of question they want us to do. So the first thing says, draw a multiple bar graph. Remember I told you they would tell you what kind of graph 
they want. So this is a multiple bar chart that represents the data in the percentage table above. Let the vertical axis range from 0 to 20 percent. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a heading and don't for, don't leave out your heading we need to know exactly what the graph is. So this is a multiple bar graph. Once I've drawn it, you'll see that it's a multiple bar graph. So I don't really need that information in the heading. It represents the data in the percentage table above. So quick trick would be go see what the heading was for the percentage table um, and then we can use that kind of same heading. So the table below shows the estimate of percentage of people who are unemployed for the different groups according to previous classification. So I can use that in my, um, in my graph and I can say that this is the percentage of unemployed people in previously in the previous racial groups in 1998. And now I've got all my information that I need. It's very important when we're actually labeling a, um, a graph is to realize that we need to bring in both the y and the x-axis. So on my y-axis I'm going to put my percentage. And they were very specific, they told me they need to go from 0 to 20 percent. So I'm going to um, see how many uh, parts of the graph I've got and make that a percentage. So I'm going to make, the first one I'm going to start with 0 and I'm going to label these 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 and 20. What is very important to note when you're drawing a graph is that you need to make your graph as big as possible. I could have actually extended this a little bit bigger but I think if I leave out just a top that's that's fine so make your graph as big as possible because if I'm going to deal with 20% kind of going up to here I'm going to have this tiny little graph which is going to be harder for me to interpret so I want my graph as big as possible so go to your minimum value which is normally zero especially when we're dealing with frequency and your maximum value well they told me was 20% and make your uh, blocks each one represent the same number of people or frequency or percentage or whatever it is that we're looking at and extend it to as big as possible. So I went up in twos, that made sense and I got that all sorted out. Right, then I'm going to um, draw, let's, let, let's, let's extend the graph a little bit. I'm going to now add my y value, my, my x-axis and this is going to be my racial groups and it's going to be, I need a multiple bar graph and I'm going to um, need kind of something very similar to what we had above, something that looks similar to that, of percentage, your total males and females for each one. So they've actually, and very often you will notice this, maybe not in the exact question that you're answering, but maybe in a subsequent question or a question before, you'll very often see something that you think, you know what, I can copy them. And in this case, I'm going to copy them. So I'm going to look at my percentages for my total, um, I'm going to give you a total, male and female. And don't forget, use colors or make it easy for us to see the difference and then don't forget your key. So let's now see, we've got total, we're doing 13.37 for our total population. So we go back to our graph. We always leave a space first. So I've got 13.37 and that is about there. I'm going to draw that down. Right, that is my total. So now my total is green. So I'm going to put a key somewhere and I'm going to say, well, that over there is my total. Right, I can add the number if I need to, but um, this will be, um, this will be, uh, this, is, this is the total population. And now I'm going to do, to change color and I'm going to do my um, males 
let's 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 make our males orange. So our males, let's go back to the table. Our males was 12.46. So we go back to there, and 12.46 is just a little bit more than 12. I'm going to draw that down. Right, so that was my males. And finally my females. Let's make females pink. And we got 14.22. So it's just above the 14 and with the 22. And those are my females. Right, and now we've got our total. And we need to do this for each one. And I'm going to carry on this graph. So now we're going to do, that was total. Now I'm going to look at my, I'll go back to my orange pen. And we're now looking at our African or black. Leave a space in between. So go back to the graph and see our African, we're looking for 15.56. 14.47 and 16.56 so on our graph and this will be a whole lot neater when you're using a ruler and when you're able to actually measure that measure correctly so 15.56 I'm going to do my total first and 15 is about um, about there 15.56 and draw graph down that's my total right I'm going to do my males Males was 14.47, just about 14. And my females, color we'll be using for females, pink, 16.56. And clearly, we can now compare this information and we can visually see the information. And I'm going to do one more, and uh, um, no, I'm going to do one more, then I might have to use a new graph paper. So colored, so let's go back to our table. 19, uh, 9.86, 9.07, and 10.61. So we're gonna go through to the right. So we've got our colored, let's go green. That was 9.86, so that's just below 10. Again, leave a space. That's my total there. My males was 9.07. Males was orange. And females was 10.61, so just above 10. Oops, let's try that again. And I've got my colored. I didn't have enough space on my graph paper. So I'm going to uh, carry on the information. I'm gonna leave my totals. I'm just gonna delete my African and colored and do the Indian and white populations and just so that we can compare. So right now we've seen that this is the highest. So I'm going to just delete that to show you what the rest of the graph should look like. But believe me, you will have enough paper. Um, so um, going back, one step to see what our Indian was 7.72, 8.35, and 7.12. So let's go forward and put that in. We needed a green pen to start. Leave a space and 7.72, 8.35 for the males. And the females, 7.12, slightly less than our total. And this was, well, don't forget to label it. So this was our Indian. Let's go back to my green. I was labeling everything in green. I'm going to carry on with that. Indian. And the last group, well, let's do the last one, was um, going back at 2.953 and 2.91. was our last one was our what and with our green we've got 2.95 it's just below three that's not that's that that's not three that's four because below three and um, three exactly for our males orange just a little bit higher than that 
and our females was 2.91. Okay, now that we've got our draft to graph totally drawn, um, we can easily compare and, and see the information that was on the table. That was a little bit, this is a little bit easier to see the information. Um, and we're gonna use this to answer the questions, I'm sure. I just wanna double check that I've actually done exactly what they wanted. So they said, draw a multiple bar chart that represents the data in the percentage table above. Got that. Let the vertical axis range from zero to 20. I've got that. Now whenever I draw a graph, be aware you need a heading, you need to label both of your axes. Your vertical or y-axis, your horizontal or x-axis is labeled and make sure that the labels make sense. So giving labels like total, Indian, white, that tells me what I'm dealing with but I also want to know what those categories are. I always say to kids, if you're going to be labeling months of the year and you're going to go January, February, March, yes, I know as an examiner and as a teacher that they are months of the year, but let's not assume that. So tell me that they're months of the year. So always label in full and rather give more information than less. Make sure when you're doing a multiple bar graph that you have the um, key of what each one represents. You can do it inside the key, you can do it on the side, you can do it with colors, you can do it only in pencil, and, but make sure I understand and whoever's marking your work understands. You can, um, you can label them differently. You know, you can put dots in one and squares in the other and lines, um, et cetera, et cetera. But colors make it easy to see and colors make it easy to mark. Don't forget your ruler. Don't do what I've just done without a ruler. Right, let's now go see what the questions are. So, the question says, which section of the population had the highest unemployment rate in 1998? Now, we can see this from our graph that we've just drawn, and we can see it from the table that, that we had. So, I'm going to look at my graph in fact, I don't have that population any longer because I deleted it. But if possible, don't use your graph to answer a type of question like this. Let's rather go back to the information from the implement, just in case we made a mistake. I know our graph was right, but just in case you made a mistake, go back to information they have given you. It always makes it just that little bit kind of at, at testing your, your information. So looking at our table, we're looking at um, the question said, and I'm going to read that question again. The question said, which section of the population had the highest unemployment rate in 1998? So let's go back to this table and we see the highest population was definitely um, that one over there and that is the African black population. So we needed to go back, uh, no we don't need there, and we're going to add our answer, it was the African black population. And you can even give a total of what that percentage was, but it's not necessary. Have we answered the question? We have answered the question correctly. Now what's nice about these kind of questions is that your mark allocation is two marks for reading off a table or a graph. And we normally allocate two marks for this and they're nice easy marks. Right, let's see what our next question is. Our next question was, was the unemployment rate in general higher amongst males or females? And briefly explain your answer. So let's go back to the table and see which was higher, males or females. That's not the table. Right, so I'm going to delete all the, these lines that I've drawn you here and see. Right, here we have females higher in the total population females higher in the African black population, females higher in colored. This one was males higher, I'm gonna leave that one out. And this one was females as well. So in general, can we say which is higher? Are females higher in total and in two out of the four populations that we're dealing with? And we know that our Indian Asian and white populations are the smaller populations. So the question, let's go back to what the question said. The question said, was unemployment in general higher amongst males or female? So in general, I would say it was higher amongst females. 
and then briefly explain. Well, we can give an explanation of it was higher in the total, higher in the total population, which I think is important because that's our kind of our general. It was also higher in, uh, it was higher in the African, in the African black population, and it was higher, now I've lost my pen, it was higher in the Asian and Indian, and it was kind of only lower in two of the smaller populations. So that would be your explanation. You give a lot of information, so let's just write that in. So it was only lower, slightly lower, in the Indian, no, that, was, that wasn't Asian, that was colored. My mistake. So it was only slightly lower in the Indian and the white populations. So if we look at that, we can quite safely say that in general, the females were at a higher rate of unemployment than the males. So let's go see what the next question says. Right, so we've answered that. Just double checking, was the unemployment rate in general higher amongst males or females? And briefly explain, we've done that. Often you don't need to use numbers to actually answer a kind of question like this. It's based on your knowledge and on your way of communicating the information in the data. Right, let's see what the next question is. Were there more unemployed Indian Asian people than unemployed white people in 1998? and explain your answer. So were there more? Now we're looking at people and we rather than looking at percentage. So let's go back to the table. That's not the table. Let's go back to the table. From our table we can see percentage wise there are more unemployed Indians than there are white percentage wise but we are looking at people so I need to now compare this to the number of people in those two populations so I'm going to just look at the total so it was 7.72 and this 2.95 now I need to go back to my other table there was one before that and see what values I need to compare it to so I'm looking at the population of South Africa and I'm looking at the Indian and the white populations, and, and we're looking at the totals. So in 1998, so I'm going to look at my totals there and my total over there to compare whether I've got more or less number of people. So um, my Indian population was 107.5, so I've got those numbers here, so I can go through to the next page and see Right, I seem to be doing a lot of work for those two marks if I'm looking at percentages. So it makes me think that I have missed something and I'm glad I've done it this way. So what do you think I've missed? I'm going to go back to all those tables that I have. There was the table I've used. I know that what I was going to do was correct. No, that was a question before. But this gives me the number of people of unemployed in South Africa. And it gives me this information by race category. So can I not look at these totals over here of Indians and white? So I can do that. And now see the, why there was only two marks allocated for something that I was going to do this very long, big, complicated calculation of working out the numbers from percentages. But I have it here. So if I look at the number of people unemployed, for the Indian Asian, there were 83. We're looking at thousands, 83,000 people who were unemployed. And the whites, there were 133,000. And that gives me my comparison that I need for this question, which is only worth two marks. So I've got my 83, let me get that, it was 83, 83 thousand that were Indian Asian and a hundred and thirty three thousand that were white and now I can see were there more unemployed Indian people than unemployed white 
No, there were not. So I'm going to answer my question properly. No, there were not more. There were, in fact, more white people in 1998. And we can say, well, refer to the numbers above and the first graph. So let's say, well, refer to the first graph that we looked at. And now I can see that my two marks actually warranted just two marks. Right. Let's carry on. If the ratio of unemployed, sorry, the ratio of employed to unemployed people remains the same as it was in 1998, estimate how many unemployed people there were in South Africa in 2001 when the total population went to 44.8 million. There's my 44.8 million that I explained to you earlier. Now, we haven't been dealing with ratio. So where did this ratio come in? We were looking at percentages. So now all of a sudden they've said ratio. So now I'm thinking, what are they talking about? But we were dealing with percentage of unemployed. We were looking with, we were dealing with percentage of unemployed. And we were dealing with, I'm just going to look at our total and go back to, to this graph, percentage unemployed of 13.37%. So our percentage total was 13.37%. Um, is that a ratio? It actually is a ratio because I've got 33 0.37 out of my total population, which is always 100. So as a percentage, that means that 33.3 out of my total are unemployed. So this actually is a very special type of ratio. So what do they mean by if the ratio of employed to unemployed people remains the same? So these are my unemployed 13.37, which means my employed is the balance of my percentage. So I can take that as 100 minus my 13.37. So let's do that on my calculator. So 100 minus 13.37. And I'm left with 86.63. So 86.63% of the population were employed. So we had a ratio of 13.37, sorry, let me put that number in, 86.63. So my ratio was of unemployed to employed was 86.63. That is my ratio of unemployed to employed. So dealing with a percentage, I can actually think about it as a ratio. And the question was, if it remains the same that it was in 1998. Estimate how many unemployed people there will be in South Africa in 2001 when the population increases. So now I'm going to take my population increase, which was my 44.8 million. I'm going to times that by a million to get the number of people. Remember, we did that earlier. So I'm going to say 44.8 times by a million, two, three, one, two, three, and I get 44 million 800,000. So let's write that in. Be careful when you're dealing with these very, very big numbers on your calculator. Rather sit and count and, and, and make sure that you've got the correct number of zeros. It's very easy when we're dealing with a big number to leave off a zero. So keep checking. Make sure that you actually have all the zeros. And it makes it easier if we write it as with spaces. So I'm going to say 44,800,000 people. Now my ratio stays the same, which means that I still have 13.37% of the population is unemployed. So I'm going to take that and type that onto my calculator. Now I've got my 44 million, so I can just times that by 13.37 and percent, and I get this number. I'm going to count from the back. So there's my three, there's my three, five million nine hundred eighty-nine thousand. So I'm going to write that number in um, as uh, um, five 
I could have done this two ways. So 5, 9, 8, 9. And it said estimate, somewhere above. It said estimate. Estimate the number of people. So I can actually round this number off. But let's write it in fully. 989760. Let's write it in fully. 760. That's the number of people that are unemployed. So I can estimate, I can round it off, and I can say, more or less, this is close to kind of 6 million people. Or I could have left it as um, 6 with the three zeros. Uh, 6 zeros in a million. So I can round it off because it is an estimate. So as soon as they say estimate, it gives me that permission. Now there's one other way we could have actually done this without multiplying by our million. So we could have taken our 44.8 million and times it by 13.37%. This is a big or. In fact, I should change the color. Um, let's change color now. So I could have done, on my calculator, what I could have done is said, well, I've got 44.8 million. And leave that million out for now. Times by my 13.37%. And I get an answer of 5, 98976. So I'm going to round it off to 5,99. Let's make it 5,99, or let's even round it to 6. We were estimating, so let's go back to here. So that was 5, in my pen, it was 5,99. But now don't forget that million, because it was 5,99 million. And again, I can kind of round that off to 6 million. So I have the same answer whether I work in the millions or whether I work in the full numbers. And it might be easier to do it this way, but then don't forget to add your millions. Don't forget to always add your um, unit or whatever we're dealing with. And this is million people. People who are unemployed. We can actually go so much as to say that. But They've asked us that, so we've answered correctly. Now let's just double check that we actually have answered correctly. If the ratio of unemployed to employed people remains the same as it was in 98, estimate how many unemployed people there were in South Africa in 2001 when the total population was 44.8 million. Right, so I have given them that answer, so I know that I've answered the question correctly and everything is there that I need, makes sense, and. Um, my question was actually quite logically set out. And that takes us to the end of that question, and that what's left now for you is to do your homework. Now, I just want to give you a couple of reminders of what we've done, and just to help you with your homework. So we're dealing with collecting data. Remember, you need to take your data, you're going to need to do surveys, or whatever it is you do, and you're going to put that data into tables, um, I want you to do it logically. I want you to start with the first lot of information and kind of go in, in order. Don't just look for the numbers, like I said to you earlier when we were right at the beginning of the lesson. Um, I want you to analyze it into tally tables or whatever, it, whatever kind of information will help. Draw your graphs. They make it easier. Whenever you're given a question, read through the question fully and then go back and analyze every single table they give you. Don't just assume that the table's correct and the table, you know what the table says because you've read the heading. Go through every column. Does it make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, stop and think, why doesn't it make sense? Like we did with that question about the percentages where the females seemed higher than the total. So, Analyze every question carefully, every table, every graph, before you go on and answer the questions. And guys, don't forget to reread the question once you've done your calculations. Look at your mark allocation. I nearly made that mistake with the two marks where um, I was going to do this long, long calculation and realize it was only two marks. And the information was actually just on a table that I needed to read off the table. So look at your mark allocation and take it one step at a time. So good luck with your homework, and uh, thank you for today. See you again soon.